Father, we just invite your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. We thank you that your word declares that we have an anointing, one, uh, anointing, an option from the Holy One, that we really don't need a man to teach us, but yet, Lord, you've chosen to raise up teachers, and we know that truth comes through the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. So we just pray that you would bless this time in your word, this time of sharing, Lord, that uh, we would each receive what we need to be who you've called us to be. I speak blessings over this time and thank you that no spirit, contrary to the Holy Spirit, will be able to uh, seize away from us what the Holy Spirit wants to impart. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I mentioned I was a country boy. I'll read a little letter for you. Just uh, uh, It's a little levity here at the beginning, but it reminds us of how we can have different mindsets and think differently and see life differently. This is a humorous letter. Uh, we call it here in the South, it was a, a letter from a redneck mama to her son. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. She wrote, Dear son, I'm writing this slow because I know you can't read fast. We don't live where we did when you left. Your dad read in the paper that most accidents happen within 20 miles of home, so we moved. Won't be able to send you the address as the last Arkansas family that lived here took the numbers with them for their house so they wouldn't have to change their address. This place has a washing machine. The first day I put four shirts in it, pulled the chain, and haven't seen them since. It only rained twice this week, three days the first time and four days the second time. The coat you wanted me to send you, Aunt Sue said it would be a little too heavy to send in the mail, with them heavy buttons, so we cut them off and put them in the pockets. We got a bill from the funeral home, and it said we didn't make the final payment on Grandma's funeral bill. Up she comes. <laughs> About your sister. She had a baby this morning. I haven't found out whether if it's a boy or a girl, so don't know if you're an aunt or an uncle. Your Uncle John fell in the whiskey bath. Some men tried to get him out, but he fought them off playfully, so he drowned. We cremated him, and he burned for three days. Three of your four friends went off, to, off the bridge in a pickup. One was driving, and the other two were in the back. The driver got out. He rolled down the window and swam to safety. The other two drowned. They couldn't get the tailgate down. Not much more news this time. Nothing much happened. If you don't get this letter, please let me know, and I will send another one. Love, Mom. <laughs> Welcome to Life in the South. <laughs> it is amazing how um, we live from different uh, areas, come from different perspectives, and we see life differently. But I want to talk to you this morning for a few moments about seeing the kingdom. This is a kingdom culture conference, and I, as I was praying, I felt like this introductory teaching that I did it should just be about seeing the kingdom. Now, we're going to look at one verse of Scripture in particular. It's in a very familiar passage of Scripture to you. It's John chapter 3, the occasion when Nicodemus, the religious ruler, comes to Jesus, and very simply, in, in verse 3 of John 3, you know, Nicodemus comes and says, We know you're a teacher come from God. No man can do these things except God be with him. And Jesus says this. He said, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless, now notice that, <laughs> unless, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, you know, simply put, this scripture tells us that every person we meet, unless something happens to them intrinsic, intrinsically by the Spirit of God, they're simply not going to be able to see what you see, hear what you hear, or understand what you're telling them about. So we want to develop cultures in our own daily personal life where we're seeing the kingdom, and we want to have an impact on the people, the, the congregation that we may lead or pastor or feed, the, the community or city in which we live. We want to impact and influence them 
so that their eyes are open and they can see the kingdom. Now, Jesus said that it requires a new birth experience. Yeah. Now, that was confusing to Nicodemus. Why? Because at this point, he couldn't see the kingdom. You know, he's trying to, to understand spiritual things through a natural line of thought. And that's exactly what we have to confront each and every day we live our lives in the culture we're living. And we're all very well aware of the direction that our culture is headed here in the United States of America. But hopefully and positively and optimistically, we have the answer. You know, if we can just see the Holy Spirit moving in, in powerful ways to open people's eyes so that they can see the kingdom, everything will change yes. in a moment. So this scripture tells us that heaven has to help us. People need help from heaven yes. in order to see the kingdom. Mm -hmm. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. Now that's also a liberating truth for us because if we're not careful, we'll feel all this responsibility like I've got to see breakthrough in that person's life. I've got to do this. You know, I've got to do that. But really Jesus told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, what you need you're only going to see it, receive it, and know it experientially through the, through the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life. Thank God that heaven has to help people. That means the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, the Holy Spirit will help us to help them uh, to see the kingdom of God. So, again, you know, often uh, I'm a part of a men's Bible study group. We've been meeting every Tuesday morning at 6.30 for over eight years now. And very often in our discussions on Tuesday, we try to boil down what we're learning that day. And very often we come away with the conclusion, well, this tells us we must rely upon the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, thank God for methods, structures, infrastructure, foundations, for, for, uh, for assist systems that we can put in place to help us. But at the end of the day, those things are just tools to, to facilitate what the Holy Spirit must do. You can't save anybody. I can't save anybody. It, it must be the activity of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is talking to a well-educated religious man, but yet they're on two different wavelengths. Nicodemus was seeing things happen. He couldn't explain them apart from God, but yet he didn't understand how those things could be happening. And we have... Um, in our daily walk and in our churches and, and in the outreaches of our church, we're engaging people that are at different places along that spiritual spectrum. And particularly here in the Bible Belt, and which would include, I think, most of us here, if not all of us, in the Bible Belt, there is a what I call Bible Belt blindness. You know, so many people, they've gone to church, they've heard about the church, they, some have done the church thing, they've heard the Jesus thing, and there's a lot of religiosity. There's a lot of activity of the spirit of religion. And it's really created a lot of intrinsic obstacles in people's lives. The Bible calls that in 2 Corinthians 10 strongholds. Those things that exalt themselves over the knowledge of God. And in reading the Bible, we, we may not see the truth of the Bible because of these strongholds. This Bible belt blindness. Well, yeah, I read that verse, but really what that means is what my preacher told me. You know, really what that means? Well, yeah, my grandma told me what that means. And, and people had to have a breakthrough, often birthed through desperation. You know, Nicodemus, he took some risky steps even coming to Jesus. And he came at night, but he was well aware of what it could cost him to be seen too closely associated with Jesus, but yet something was percolating in his heart that told him, you know, this has to be God. And if it's God, I want to I understand it. So he's a searcher. He is hungry. And this teaching that, I, that I'm sharing this morning, I really feel where, where the Lord wants me to, to take you is to begin to see ourselves, uh, see your ministry as a bridge ministry, in a sense. I know uh, there, particularly here in the Bible Belt, which again would, would be all of us here, there are so many people who have already wet their feet in the scripture. Uh, they may have wet themselves in the baptistries. They may know Jesus. They may have had this new birth experience, but yet they're really not seeing. Now they have the capability to see because they know the Lord, 
But yet, because of these strongholds, they, these religious obstacles, wrong teaching, um, maybe just being lethargic, never being exposed to the truth, never hearing the teaching about the Holy Spirit, uh, reducing the kingdom to just the new birth experience, and that's it, wait for Jesus to come. There has to be breakthrough in their lives. But what we have going for us in trying to reach people that way, if they are saved, then the Holy Spirit lives in them. And so the Holy Spirit's going to be faithful to the ministry he's been given in the life of that person to create hunger. And Nicodemus had enough proof to know the things he was seeing wasn't the activity of the devil. No man can do these things except God be with him. And I know that's my own personal testimony that I'm going to share just a little bit of in a moment. But we want to, uh, uh, to, to be ministers who, who, who lead in our congregation how to interact with, with people here in the Bible Belt in a way that hunger is awakened with them for the supernatural and for the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, our um, neighborhoods are filled with people who... Some of them have really good uh, biblical foundations. You know, they grew up. I grew up as a, a free will Baptist who became a Southern Baptist. But in my years in the Southern, in Southern Baptist Church, I had a really strong biblical foundation. Memorized lots of scripture. Could lead people to Christ and learn how to identify where God was moving. A lot of those things. Believed in the Holy Spirit, but wow. You know, my, I had these things on. And so there's so many people out there. They can be baptized in the Holy Spirit, have their eyes open to the kingdom, and they're ready to roll. They can be good, strong leaders and workers in our ministries, and we, we, we see that very often at Grace House because we, we feel like we're a bridge church in that sense. Many people who already know the Lord come to be introduced to the supernatural because of testimonies they've heard or, 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 or you know, they have friends at work that are, are experiencing the Spirit, and it creates a hunger. And uh, this is not to exclude the many, many lost people. That has to be our primary mission, right? Yes. And we can raise them up and ground them. But my heart really goes out for the, the, the large portion of the body of Christ who really are not seeing the kingdom in its fullness. Yeah. Yeah. And so to have these experiences to deal with those uh, barriers and blockades in our thinking and those strongholds. Uh, recently, we... Uh, we had a, a, a young Baptist minister who was a worship minister in a church and not too far from here. But he attended one of, we had an evening uh, service going on. And he attended, and the Lord really touched him through the Holy Spirit. And he became so excited, he got, he didn't even really know what it was, but it was a word of knowledge. He came up to me, I mean, it's just like he went from... Um, Bored to bold and just one quick step, you know? Yeah. He runs up there in the altar time. He said, Pastor said, I just felt this and saw this. Now, I don't know what it is. I said, That's a word of knowledge. And I put the mic up and I said, Our brother wants to share something. I said, Share it. He's like, <laughs> And he said, Well, I just feel like there's somebody here and they're having this pain. And he, he described it. And I said, You know, he's just plugged into the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's already used him. Who is that here in David Particulars? And this person raised their hand. I said, come on up. And they came up and, and I said, now, the Lord gave you this. We want you to pray for, for this uh, man and he's going to be healed. You want me to pray? <laughs> and so he said, just a minute. And this, yeah. it was hilarious, but it was, it was hilarious in a holy way. He said, just a minute. He goes over the altar. He gets down on his knees <laughs> and starts praying. And, and he stays there for a moment. We're watching this. Then he comes back over and he said, okay, I think I can pray now. <laughs> and uh, he starts praying and, and he, he starts praying around the world. And I said, I said, now, I said, I interrupted him. I said, hey, hey, just, just command that thing to go. And just pray for this person. And go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he prayed it real simply. And I said, now, ask if, it, if it's all right. Do you have the pain? And it was gone. The Lord healed it. Wow, he really came unglued. Yeah. Because in a few moments, he saw the activity of the Holy Spirit. Right. He stepped into it, received it for himself. Yeah. And, and very, very rare, but I mean, 
Then, like a few minutes later, he's having a word of knowledge. Then he's praying for somebody to be healed. He, he's been bad. <laughs> but he, he, he just had his world wrong. And that's how quickly someone can shift from just being a worship leader in a Baptist church and going through the motions to see the kingdom. And that's what we want to happen. Because I believe the movement of God that is, is going to come. I, I'm very optimistic in my view of the end time. We win. You know, when Jesus comes, when Jesus comes back, he's not coming for a crippled up, wounded, head hanging, hiding in a whole rock. You know, he's coming back for a bride that knows who she is, full of the Holy Spirit, gloriously radiating the glory of God and taking ground for her king. I believe that with all my heart. And so that tells me, I, listen, I know Jesus loves his church. You remember the Damascus Road thing, right? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus, Saul was persecuting those folks in Jerusalem who wanted Damascus to do it. Jesus took it personally. He doesn't like people to, to persecute his church or to talk about his pride. So I went through a season in my life and the Lord really dealt with me about that. I pastored about an hour and a half, about, well, about an hour and 15 minutes from here at First Baptist Church in Payable. It's in Winston County. It's the largest Baptist church in the county. I had um, gone through seminary in, in the Baptist world, and uh, finally this big church called me, you know, big church and big salary and country, even had a country club membership, and, and everything I thought I wanted was on paper. And I finally got called to this church, and I was so excited. And um, I was Mr. Conservative Baptist. I went to the most conservative Baptist theological seminary that I could find. And, and I loved it. And I served, while I was in seminary, I served at a church called Bellevue Baptist Church. Dr. Adrian Rogers was my pastor, and I was an intern under him. And it was a glorious time of learning, and I loved it. And I uh, pastored out of seminary for about four years and then was called to this church down in Haleville. And it was like a dream come true. And the church was growing. We were winning people to the Lord. We were recognized by the Billy uh, Graham School of Evangelism and being in the top 5% of churches by ratio in the growth. And things were going good. But I found myself very disillusioned. Like doing the stuff you had to do, you know, see church grow, and things were going well, but inside I was feeling so hollow. I, I had become desperate, and um, I just didn't know what was going on. It did not make sense. You know, I should have been happy, but I, I, I wasn't. I should have been excited and burning for Jesus, but instead was, there was this gnawing sensation deep inside of me that there had to be more, and I found myself just praying that and saying that, like, Lord, there's got to be more than this, you know, going through the motions and it's like cranking things up. There's just got to be more to the Christian life. I just don't want to be a professional minister. Yeah. And in the middle of that season, God began to do some things. You know, when, when you become desperate, it causes you to hunger and pray. And Jesus taught us Blessed is he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for he shall be filled. There is a, an inherent promise in hunger for God. Yes. It's like God says, if I find somebody who's hungry for me, I'm going to introduce myself to them in a deeper way. Mm. You know, we, we see that show up in Scripture at different places. Draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. It's just that law of reciprocation. God's going to reciprocate. When you move toward him, he's going to move toward you. You move an inch toward him, he'll sweep across the galaxies to get to you. Yeah. That's his daddy's heart for us. So yeah. I was there in um, First Baptist Church, Halo, and I said, desperate, Lord, there's got to be more. And so I want to tell you a, a story. Because um, during this season, a few months before this season started, I got a phone call one night. And I said, hello. And the boss said, is this a uh, pastor down at that First Baptist Church? And I said, yes, it is. 
He said, I heard you got a doctor degree. I said, well, yeah, I've been seminary, and I've, I've yes, yes. Well, I need to ask you some questions. And he told me his name. told me his name was Bucky. And he said, I've been doing, I was doing some praying, and I'm getting this word. Keeps, I, it, just, it just keeps coming up, and I keep speaking it, and it doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, he, he said, I heard you knew Hebrew, some Hebrew and Greek, and so... I thought you might help me, and he told me the word. <clears throat> and uh, I said, well, just so happens I happen to know that word. Uh, that, that, that's the, the, the Hebrew word for glory, kabod. And, and <clears throat> he said, well, that makes sense, and that makes sense to me. And uh, I should appreciate you uh, helping me there. That makes sense to me. Now, I know what that prayer means. And it's a real strange thing. And I could tell he was, he was um, um, a spiritual man, but an uneducated man, and this will unfold and make more sense to you. Well, a few weeks passed, I get a phone call. Uh, Pastor, this is Bucky again. I've been praying, and I got this word coming up, bubbling up, and I keep saying it, and he shared it with me, and I said, yeah, I, I, I just happen to know that word too. And uh, I said, that's a Greek word, and this is what it means. And he said, hmm, well, that sure is neat. That makes sense, I, what God's trying to tell me. And so that happened three or four times. And he'd get to sharing other things. He'd tell me about a dream he had had. And I remember one night hanging up and telling my wife, she said, who was that? I said, well, it's this strange guy. His name's Bucky. And I said, I, I think he's a little, you know, too far out there. And he's coming up with all this stuff. We just need to pray for him that he'll get straightened out. You know, he just got issues. And that was really my attitude toward him. And he had called a number of times and then, one day, I'm, I'm in my office, and the secretary buzzes back, and she said, Pastor, she said, uh, there's a man out here that wants to see you, and his name is Bucky Baker. And he, he doesn't have an appointment, but he wants to see you. And I thought, oh, that's Bucky. Well, I, I, I'd like to just see him face to face. You know? <laughs> Check this out. And so I go, now for you to get the, I, I want you to see the contrast here. Uh, in those days, I had an out, outer office where I had a big desk and I had some chairs and a nice receiving area. Usually when I meet with people, I meet them there. And then off that, there was a wing. I had a what, what the church called the Holy of Holies. <laughs> That's where I had my private library, my private study. You walked in there and I had, there were books on all the walls and one whole wall was reserved just for the degrees, you know. And I had my computer and I had a couch in there. And so that's where I did my hangout time and my study. And, and so I go out and I introduce myself to Bucky. And, and uh, I said, it's good to see you. And, and I said, come on in. And I brought him into the receiving area and I thought, no, I don't want the secretary to hear any of this. So I said, come on, come on back into my study. So I closed that door, went into my study and closed that door. Now we're safe, you know. I'm safe. And uh, we come in and sit down. And he says, I, I just needed to see you. I feel like that um, I need you to pray with me. I said, well, I'll be glad to pray with you, Bucky. You know what's, what's going on. And he starts sharing some things that are going on in his life. He did need some prayer. But then something happened. Something happened that would shift the axis of my life. While Bucky's sharing with me what he's needing prayer for, I heard God talk. Now, I would have told you I've heard the Lord talk. You know, preachers say, well, I feel like the Lord's led me to share this with you today. And even preachers that don't believe God talk will get up and say, well, the Lord's laid on my heart to share this with you. you know, which doesn't make sense to me. I've never done that for years. You know. And so I heard God talk. And this is what I heard God say. Have him pray for you. And I, I struggled. Now, I don't mean anything disparaging by what I'm about to share with you. I just want you to understand the context. Bucky, when I opened that door and met him and invited him back into my study, he and I were like in two different worlds. I had my coat and tie on because I wore a starch shirt and a tie and a, and a full suit every day to work. That was kind of required, you know. There he was. He had his shirt hanging out. He needed some new shoes. He had grease under his fingernails. His hair needed washing. It was long and scraggly. He needed some dental work. 
and he had a pocket of win uh, a pack of Winstons <laughs> in his front shirt pocket. Okay, I don't mean anything judgmental by that. I, I mean I'm, I'm I have no you know that that's not a judgment statement. But that's what I saw when I saw Bucky, and here I am, and uh, so I struggled with it. That I heard that voice. Have him pray for you. Now remember, this isn't a season when I pray, Lord. There's more I want. You know this doesn't. There's got to be more. And I just felt such weight on this. Like, if I don't ask him to pray for him, I'm going to miss the train. You know, it's that kind of feeling. And so, finally, I said, Bucky, wait a minute. I, I need to interrupt you. I said, uh, I think I just heard God tell me something. He said, what? I, I guess he thinks, I've, I've got a word for him. He didn't even know I didn't get words for people. You know? <laughs> really. <clears throat> and... He said, well, what is it? I said, I feel like the Lord just told me, you're supposed to pray for me. I remember this so vividly. I was looking at him. He stared at me. And I saw his Adam's apple go up and down as he got. And he said, you want me to pray for you? He saw the contract. I mean, he'd come to the big church for the big wheel pastor to to, to pray for him. And now the Lord's doing, turning the tables. I said, yeah, I think you're supposed to pray for me. You see what God was doing? He was dealing a death blow to my dignity. He was requiring me to humble myself. He was causing me to topple some strongholds so I could get to where I could receive something that I needed that I didn't even know what it was that I was needing. So I... He said, well, okay. He got up off the couch. I spun my computer chair or, or moved it toward him. He came over in front of me. He went down on his knees. I'm sitting in my computer chair. And he looked in my eyes. And he grabbed my hands. I saw his Adam apple gulp again as he swallowed. <laughs> Closed his eyes, and then he prayed. It's pretty close to what he prayed. Dear God, baptize this preacher in the power of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Help him to speak in tongues. Help him lay hands on the sick that they might be healed. Lord, help him cast out devils. In Jesus' name, amen. And he didn't pray it timidly. He opened his eyes. Oh, my eyes, and I probably look like a calf staring at a new gate. Because <laughs> I was on the horns of a dilemma. I now had a major issue that I was going to have to deal with. And here was my issue. Um, I'd had enough training, even before I went to seminary, to know that God knew everything. And if God told me that Bucky was supposed to pray for me, then God knew what Bucky was going to pray. Why would God want Bucky to pray those things for me? I mean, I also knew God had pretty good theology. Right? So here I am. What am I going to do with this? And so I was at it. I, now, when he prayed for me, I can't say he, that I felt fire God come upon me and I began to tremble. That comes a little later. But what the Lord was doing was confronting me. With, he, he started where I was. I knew he was omniscient. I knew he was true. And yet, my, and my spirit, man, I, I never even doubted that it was the Lord that spoke to me. It's just you know, it was that white and clear. So I had to do something with that. And, and um, so Bucky's there and I'm here. And I don't even remember exactly all that happened with Bucky after that. I do remember getting up and saying, well, well brother, i got to go. And um, I appreciate you coming by. And I walked him out of my holy of holies to my receiving <laughs> office. And then I was about to lay him out where the secretary was. And I thought, no, no, he let, let me let you out of here. You just go out the way I see you. I went to this door, and I let him out, and I closed the door. And I remember standing there with the lights off in the room. 
thinking, there's more, if God's telling me that, then it's God. If there's more, I bet it'd be good. <laughs> and that became a revelatory word for me to, to give me the courage to keep stepping because it's like, well, yeah, I've answered God's call on my life. I told God I'll go anywhere and do anything. You know, I, and if this is God, God's good. If this is God, then it, it's good. Why should I be afraid of it? It's like, yeah, yeah, thank you, Brother Hugh. And I can't tell you the rest of the story, but over the next several days, there were four people, just like Bucky and just like Hugh, over a period of four days, there were four people that came. Neither one of them was aware of the other. But God brought me revelatory words, very specific, just like uh, some of them like biblical. There's no way they could have known what I'm going through. And it just led me to the point where by that was that started on a Monday and by Thursday afternoon, I went to my home, closed the door, Holy Spirit filled the room, I began speaking in tongues. I opened my Bible up and I started seeing stuff that I had preached, I had taught, I had studied, but it was coming to life. Information was becoming incarnation yeah. in my life. And it resulted in me um, being filled with the Holy Spirit at a meeting where John Kilpatrick was. That's another story I may share this week. I don't know. But God used people I never thought he could use. But he would not have been on 
on my list. If you'd asked me the kind of person God could use in my life, it wouldn't have been Bucky. It wouldn't have been Bucky. But God chose Bucky. He knew he was probably the only one in town that had guts enough to pray over me what needed to be prayed. And it opened, opened things up for me. I began to see the kingdom. And you all know, those of you, when you begin seeing that and experiencing it, there's no turning back. Very much. Everything else is almost stale bread. You know, when you start realizing how spiritual this adventure called the Christian life really is. And so I want to conclude by encouraging you personally this question, because as, you, as you're leaving your congregation, whatever ministry you have, I felt the Lord wanted me to, act, act, to encourage you along this line. I'm going to use a question. I want to ask this question. What pathways are you cultivating that enable people to experience, have these introductory experiences and encounters with the Holy Spirit? I think we need to be more purposeful. One thing we've done at Grace House is over two years ago, we have one Sunday night a month. It's the only time we have a Sunday night service called the Night of Healing. We put it on the radio. We invite people. And we have a small group of our people that come to help do the praying. But by and large, it's people from other churches. We've had a number of Church of Christ. We have Catholic people that come. We have Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians that very first night we had it, we had a Church of Christ lady that came with a group. Her face had been numb on one side for months. No feeling in her face. She got out of the car. When she stepped across the threshold into our building, all her feeling came back into her yeah. face. And you know what? You could not convince her that was from the God. Yeah. And she, 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 she stopped. She told me, wow, I just... My feeling just came back into my face. You know, man, let's go on in here and stay anyway. We want to see what this is about. But month by month, that has become like a, a gang plank, a good one. You know, leading people on board the uh, supernatural ship of the gospel to, to, to see God moving. Nicodemus said, no man can do these things yeah. that we see you doing except God be with them. There was opportunities for the onlookers to see the activity of the Holy Spirit. And you know, we're living in an age uh, uh, where a lot of churches don't even have a response time. You know, where, where there's ministry offered. I feel like that's important uh, for people to be able to see the Spirit of God moving upon people, whether they're being saved or receiving a healing or being encouraged. We need to have atmospheres that make room for the Spirit of God to move. And so... We need to be purposeful in our prayers. Lord, give us strategy. Give us ways for people to be introduced to this. Now, I know one thing the dwelling place is known for is they're taking it out into the streets. You guys are. I mean, we hear the story, and I just think that's wonderful that people get to see the kingdom operating on the front porch or on the sidewalk. You know, that's just incredible. That's so John 3. I mean, they... You've seen that look on their eyes. This has to be God. And isn't it wonderful when you can say, okay, so you are having that pain shooting down your right hip into your knee, down in your ankle. And so when we pray, if that leaves, will you believe that was God? And you've seen the look on their eyes. You know what? Wow. They have, that's a bucky moment for them. <laughs> They have to do something with that. If that's God, then how am I going to respond? If that's God, in that moment, they begin to observe and see some things, even in the natural, that becomes a bridge to lead them into the kingdom. So pray for, for our congregation at Grace House. Let's pray for one another. We'll be yeah. here in a moment. Yeah. That we'll begin to get revelatory strategies of, of how we can cultivate yeah. opportunities for people to see the kingdom. Because yeah. once you start seeing it, things begin to happen. Yeah. And uh, we are, particularly here in our country, 
uh, I'm grieved at times at the steps the church is taking to push the Holy Spirit out. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and, and not out of the church into the streets, but um, doing what we're doing without giving the Holy Spirit opportunities yeah. to move. So we've got to guard that. You know, we've got to make sure that we cultivate those opportunities. And personally, how am I cultivating? Ask yourself this question. How am I cultivating my vision for the kingdom? Because, you know, when we've been in it a while, if we're not careful, we can become familiar. And we'll cease to see those little indicators that are invitations to us. One of the dangers for those of us in ministry is becoming professionals in ministry. Yeah. You know, and we can we be, we can just go through religious motions and lose that acute sensitivity we need to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would open our eyes, Lord, to first of all, as I just said, Lord, that we could we would be very consciously aware of the indications that the Holy Spirit's doing something, whether it's a question someone asks, or a feeling, a sensation, a prompting. Lord, that we would be acutely aware of these invitations yeah. of the Holy Spirit. I want to thank you publicly that Bucky Baker yeah. came to see me, he followed the Holy Spirit, yeah. and that he had the courage to yeah. pray what needed yeah. to be prayed. Lord, I thank you for that boldness you gave him. And my friend Hugh, Lord, who's now with you yeah. uh, there in heaven, Lord, for him to be discerning and to say what uh, a word from heaven in that moment, we want to be those kind of people, yeah. Lord, that are bold and they're discerning and can do like Jesus, only yeah. say what we hear the Father speaking and only do what we see the yeah. Father doing. Lord, give us vision to see yeah. the kingdom yeah. and help us to call the vague atmospheres yeah. where we yeah. minister and where we serve so yeah. other people, onlookers, look first-time attenders, uh, Lord, people we meet on the street, yeah. can see the activity of the kingdom and be able to encounter Jesus in that moment and see their lives shifted and translated yeah. into the kingdom of God's own dear Son. And Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here this morning. I pray your Holy Spirit would stir them, quicken them during these days we have together. Lord, may all this work together so that we're more aware, more sensitive, more bold, more in tune with what the Holy Spirit is saying, what the Holy Spirit is doing. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.